Okay, Robert, over to you. Thanks so much. So welcome everyone. Uh, let me know if you can see some slides that I just presented. Give me a thumbs up if you can see them. And uh, this is not actually a presentation per se. Uh, hopefully some of you, let me turn my camera on. <laughs> Uh, hopefully some of you were just at our session where we went really deep into cross-tenant data migration. Um, we expected that there would be a lot of questions following up from that session and some, some good questions uh, came up and we already answered them. Uh, but now we have a whole 45 or 50 minutes to, for you to grill us and uh, ask us anything you want to ask us about regarding the things that we work on. So you might be wondering, well, what is the, what is the complex orgs team? And uh, I'll get everybody to introduce themselves in a, in a moment. But sometimes we use the term complex orgs to describe the needs of our enterprise customers that, well, you guessed it, they're more complex than a typical small or medium business. And so that's where you know we often see scenarios like, these customers, and, and you work for these customers, you undergo mergers, acquisitions, and divestitures as part of your business strategy. You often have multiple tenants in your organization because maybe there's different business units and product brands that operate autonomously, but um, they you you need to have some end user collaboration or you know administration requirements across those tenants. Uh, often, we complex organizations are multinationals with data residency requirements, and you might have data residency requirements, you know, different requirements in different jurisdictions that you operate in, and you need the service to uh, to support those requirements. So, before we dig into a little bit more into the the topics that we'll welcome you to ask questions on, let's get the team to introduce themselves. Um, I'm not sure if Anshul is here yet. We just got off this previous call. So let's start with uh, Brian, if you want to introduce yourself. Sure. How is everybody today? Uh, so my name is Brian Day. I've been in the M365, M365 space for a few years now. Uh, my primary areas of work in our team are around data residency, which Rob uh, mentioned a few moments ago, making sure that we're storing data at rest for customers where it's supposed to be, giving them options to move it around should they desire, as well as this exciting new space in the tenant the tenant migration world. So we'll uh, talk a little bit more about what those things are, and uh, I hope some of you throw down the gauntlet and give us some good questions today. <laughs> Thanks, Brian. Estelle, do you want to introduce yourself? Um, sure. Let me turn my camera on. Hi. Yeah, I'm Estelle, and I've been with Microsoft for about two years. Uh, I'm the PM for domain sharing feature. Um, yeah, so let us know if you have any questions about the domain sharing feature and uh, with mailbox migration coexistence as well. Thanks. Hi, I'm Georgia Huggins, uh, product manager for M365. So. <clears throat> um, I work on uh, building content migration solutions for customers undergoing mergers, acquisitions, and divestitures. Um, I am the product manager currently for cross-tenant mailbox migration, and um, I hope to answer any additional questions that I was unable to in the last session as well. So nice to see everyone. Over to you, Mandy. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Hi, my name is Mandy Ndoro. Um, I'm a product manager on the M365 team. I've been uh, with Microsoft for about two years. I primarily work on uh, people search for multi-tenant organizations and cross-tenant policy. So looking to how we can enable uh, cross-tenant collaboration experiences. Uh, feel free to ask questions about that. Thanks, Thank Mandy. And I'm Rob, I'm also a product manager in the same team, working on all the same stuff that everybody else here is working on. So uh, just because Ask the Experts can be a pretty broad you know, forum for questions, uh, these are the areas where we're most prepared to talk about. So cross-tenant data migration, domain sharing for email, multi-tenant organizations and data residency. Um, but uh, 
you know, we'll we'll try to cover as much ground as we can here. The team has a lot of good experience, and I know there's some there's a lot of experts on this call actually. So, uh, with that said, this is a, an open forum. So, could you, if you have a question, there's two two ways we could do this. One is the preferred way: raise your hand and uh, ask the question. We'll just go through questions in the order that you raise your hand, and uh, if you also want to type your questions into the chat, that gives us a little bit of a heads up and more time to think about the questions, you know, as one person is answering uh, one question. But um, we'll try to get through the chat too. It's just hard to keep up with questions in the chat if, the, if they're going by really fast. So with that said, looks like uh, Julian, Stefan, you've got your hand up. Go ahead. Hey, how's it going, everybody? Um, great last session. Um, one question I answered, I, just, I, don't, I had asked, but there wasn't enough time. Um, I know it was mentioned about there's a uh, there's a license cost, I believe, per user on the target side. Um, is there any more guidance as far as what um, upfront license might be and um, until like ELA comes into effect? Um, and then also would any resource mailboxes like shared or Room mailboxes also be subject to cost as part of the uh, on the target side as part of the migration. I can take that one. Um, so yeah, I, I think there's a um, a response in the chat, but um, because we are engineers, um, we, we generally don't talk about pricing. But um, your account management teams can probably provide more more information. Um, but specific to uh, shared mailboxes and resource mailboxes, there will not be a license requirement to move those. Thank you very much. Thanks for your question. Let's see, I'm just catching up on the chat. If anyone else has questions, we, we, we've got a long time to be here, so please ask questions. <laughs> and, and Jeff, thanks for... Uh, Thanks for chiming in about pricing. We just try uh, to make it work. Tim, are you going to say something? Yeah, uh, I put the question in the chat box. Yeah, regarding the archive mailbox migration in our exchange, exchange hybrid environment, I'm not pretty sure is the right group to ask this question, or I don't see any specific topic regarding with. Uh, uh, media boss migration. Well, so your 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 question is about hybrid migration, not between tenants, but between hybrid and on-premises. Yeah, it is migration from on-premises to exchange online. Well, this this is one of those dangerous situations where a lot of the people on the call used to own hybrid, but we haven't owned hybrid for some years, so we we wouldn't want to give you out of date information. Um, so it's probably probably best to follow up on that separately. Okay. Thanks. And I do see a couple of questions in chat that I can answer. Um, there was a question okay. about uh, GCC availability and limitations with cross-tenant mailbox migration. Uh, if the scope is cross-tenant mailbox migration, um, the answer is uh, cross-tenant mailbox migration is available in um, GCC moderate, GCC high, um, but um, it's still technically in preview. Um, so when we go general availability, that will be generally available for worldwide. And those features are available in those environments, but still in a preview mode. Uh, Georgia, for clarity, are those migrations allowed across the boundary or just within two tenants in the same environment? Uh, with, within within the same environment. So we do not yet support cross instance, or cross cloud migrations. Um, so I see another question there. Um, how many users can we migrate in parallel? So uh, like with, with the default limits in the service, it's about 300. Um, but if you have um, say a special request for a very large migration, um, we are always available um, to have a discussion with you about what the best uh, recommended guidance is for um, batch creation, submission, monitoring, and cutover. Um, so we've made customizations for um, uh, customers in the in the past to ensure that the 
quantity of mailboxes that they want to migrate move within the time period uh, that is uh, desired within the, the confines of what we can support. So um, I think, let me get the um, um, our support alias and I'll, I'll paste it in here and um, you can send those questions if you have a very particular need for, for moving faster than what the default configuration offers. Thanks, Georgia. Looks like we have a question. Uh, Heidi, you have your hand up. Do you want to go ahead and ask your question? Sure. I'm I'm trying to wrap my head around UPNs and logins. So we're stamping the target UPN into the source. So then when somebody is their mailbox is actually migrated, then what are they logging in with? Because that they were originally logging in with their uh, primary SMT p slash source upn right but the source upn isn't going till the end georgia do you want yeah. to clarify the the login experience and upns for users who are migrating sure sure um so uh, you were in our last session right yeah okay so in that scenario uh grady he was in contoso um so when he logged into his his mailbox when he logged into his machine he logged in with like grady at contoso.com and entered his credentials right. when he right. migrated his new user object was grady at mna.fabricam.com so after his migration to access the resources and his mailbox in the target tenant he would need to use those new credentials so that different upn to log in oh okay so I guess what I was thinking is if we need to keep the same domain, but that's not what this is. Well, the but domain eventually is, it's. Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. I was going to say, but eventually, if we're moving Contoso also over to Fabricam, so that's what happens a lot when we do it is. You move the domain at the end. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Right. So would they um, switch their login then, or they just which their prime, you know, because the primary SMTP and the UPN, that's how we tell people to log in. Mm -hmm. But yeah. they would be. Yeah, so I, I'll clarify that a little bit okay. too. Um, the feature we showed domain sharing for email doesn't support logging on right now. So you, you can't use a shared okay. domain for UPN and you cannot use a shared domain to log in. Even, you know, e e log in as an email address uh, is an attractive feature sometimes. So we recognize it's not perfect. It's a starting point. Um, but if your requirement is to migrate users, have them keep their email addresses and keep their login names, then it's it's basically the same challenge you have today that you have to remove right. the domain from the source and add it to the destination during the same change window. Yeah. Okay. You know that that and that makes perfect sense. I was trying to figure out if you had a way around that. So thank you. Thanks, Heidi. Thank you very much. This is exciting. <laughs> so I see a few questions in the chat. Just give us a second to catch up on these. Uh, Georgia, are group mailboxes supported? Uh, are you asking about migration in that question, uh, Malt? Yes. I, I can still answer. Um, so, so we don't yet have support for for group mailbox migration, but it's on the roadmap. Um, it is along with the because you know when we look at migrating SharePoint sites, uh, that's an important component of both Teams and group mailbox migration, right? That the, the SharePoint site persists. So. That's the, the roadmap items for SharePoint sites will eventually include sites attached to Teams and sites attached to group mailboxes. Um, Brian, there's a question about multi-geo. I'm just trying to see if you answered it in the, if that requires any other discussion. I, I can repeat it if it's helpful. Uh, so, Thankfully, a multi-geo enabled tenant and real quickly, if, if there's folks that don't know what that is, it's an optional feature customers can purchase to expand their tenant to more than one physical location. Typically, when a tenant is provisioned, it's been provisioned in one of what we call a geography or region, uh, but it would allow you to say, hey, I want George's mailbox perhaps to be stored in Canada and Rob's mailbox to be stored in Japan and Estelle's mailbox perhaps in France. 
Um, thankfully, behind the scenes, it's still a single tenant. So any of these organization relationships or other prerequisites that you're setting up for a cross-tenant migration is kind of at a global um, config level for the tenant. So regardless of whether you're migrating from, from a multi-geo-enabled tenant or to one or from one and to one, um, all of those uh, processes should continue to work. And um, while we don't have it documented yet, there would be some additional steps you could take if you want to ensure that a, a mailbox is being migrated to a specific um, geography if the target tenant was multi-geo enabled. Thanks, Brian. Um, Rob, Engelin, let, let us know if, we, uh, if you have any follow-up questions. Uh, there's a reference here to something called public folders. I don't know what that is. Uh, Becky, you've got your hand up. Yeah, I've, I've got a question for mailboxes that are on litigation hold. When you do that mailbox move, I assume all the content obviously comes over, the recoverables, the purges, versions, all of that. But the hold owners, how will that work? Like as long as there's an MEU in the target to match that hold owner, is that translated or or how the owner, the, the expiration date, all of that lit hold info, how's that work? So, so yes. All of the content that is held by a hold is migrated over. Um, and if the mailbox has a retention hold or litigation hold enabled set, well, I, I guess it's set on the user, um, the mailbox will move over and that setting litigation hold enabled true will be set in the target tenant. Um, we don't move over the retention policies um, or any of the query based holds. The mailbox will just be moved over as everything on hold at the end. Okay, yeah, and that makes sense. Those those query based ones, I wouldn't expect those to come over. Um, yeah. Just that litigation hold flag. Uh, the, the flag the hold will be set. Yeah. Yeah, the hold owner for that. Does it still reference the source owner of that? That that who set that hold? Do you know? That is a good question. I do not know, but I can follow up. Okay. Cool. Thank you. Uh huh. I feel like that might be a directory attribute. It, I, uh, I think it is, but. But yeah, we can mm -hmm. check. Okay. So it could depend on um, hybrid versus versus cloud only then. And we can uh, paste our support alias in again, Georgia from uh, from cross site mailbox migration, Becky, and then you can you can follow up with us there too. Sounds good. I also just need to set up some demo environments and do some heavy testing, I think. <laughs> Perfect. I'm scrolling through chat. Does anyone see any questions that we didn't answer? I'm curious if anybody in the audience is here that has used the preview already, if there's any feedback. Which preview, Brian? Well, across in a mailbox migration to start. Yeah, what do, what do you want us to, what do you like, what don't you like? What do you want us to do next? I see what, in 2020. Yes, we've been in preview for a long time. <laughs> Ryan, do you want to talk a little bit since you're talking about previews? Do you want to talk a little more about identity mapping and our call for folks to try that? Sounds like Becky's setting up a test lab. Yeah, we could do that. I was just um, reading a question here. So for everybody that was on our previous session uh, a little while ago, uh, one of the major steps that's still outstanding is the preparation of an MEU or mailed enabled user or a mail user, depending on what interface you're looking at, um, object in the target tenant. So today, for anybody that's gone through the preview, um, you will see that you know it, it's not hard, but it's one of those areas that's that's ever prone because um, it's easy to miss one thing. So you have to decorate that mail-enabled user with the exchange GUID, which represents the GUID of the user's primary mailbox and the source tenant, an archive GUID if they have one. Uh, you need to convert their legacy exchange DN from the source uh, tenant to a X500 proxy address in the target tenant and a whole bunch of other things. So we identified that as kind of an area where we could certainly improve the, the user experience. 
So one of the things that we mentioned in the last one briefly was something called identity mapping, which is something we're just now opening up for a private preview. Um, I'll post the URL in a second if you want to go read up. We have kind of an FAQ online. We can read up on it and then emails if you'd like to take part. Uh, but this is a, another kind of addition to this overall suite that we're doing that will allow you to essentially perform a one-to-one -one relationship and say, hey, I've got these 10,000 objects that I want to migrate from the source. Um, you do have to still create the MEU and the target, but you don't have to do all the attribute decoration. You can just throw um, say the primary SMTP of the user in the source as the external um, email address on the MEU. And then you essentially do a, a, this a mapping process where you, you give us a CSV file that says, hey, Brian's object from the source equals this new MEU and the target. Um, right now we're using the um, object goods and the target as you as a way for you to say this good equals this good. Um, you upload that into the system and then we run, it stays within the security boundary of M365. It's kind of a dual handshake approach where both tenants have to authorize the service to run as well as define what objects it's allowed to look at. And then we copy all the attributes over for you. We do um, the legacy, the end X500 proxy uh, conversion. We will copy any pre-existing X500 proxy addresses over. We'll stamp the exchange GUI, the archive GUID, and basically just prepare the MEU for migration. Uh, so you can run through that process and then just, as Georgia showed, set up a batch and say go. And then the mailbox should move, um, hopefully without any problems. Uh, so that is something that will open up for, for preview. Um, we're taking feedback to, on things that you'd like to see work better. Um, for example, um, something we're trying to do is um, instead of having you tell us what GUID matches what GUID, we thought what else could we, do, could we use here? Um, so we might um, be looking at a way to just look at the MEUs that you have and find one that has a primary SMTP address that matches the one on the source tenant. Maybe that's the right match and just ask you to do a quick verification so you don't have to, you don't have to go through this GUID to GUID process. Um, so that's identity mapping in a nutshell. I think Georgia had mentioned we're kind of building it as a, a platform to be used and expanded upon as the cross tenant migration um, features expand. So I'll type that URL in the, the chat here if anybody wants to check it out. And if you email it, you'll be emailing me. So I'll be the one responding. Thanks, Brian. <clears throat> so I think there's a lot of, uh, there's a few that relate to Jeff's comment. So I'm, I'm going to address this next. Uh, this release of cross tenant migration capability seems like it has some limitations, uh, which would still drive the need to go to a third party product for complete scenario coverage. Why are we choosing to release Exchange and OneDrive now or in the next quarter versus waiting for everything to be done uh, so that you wouldn't need a third party product at all? So it's a, it's a good question and something that we we, of course, grappled with, right? Do we wait till everything is perfect to release or can we give customers some other value sooner? And, and giving value as soon as possible is, is our general um, ethos and, and principle here. So we have worked with many customers where mailboxes and OneDrives were, um, okay, so first of all, for some customers, that's all they needed to move. And, um, we have customers like uh, I think Michael noted here that say we're, it's our policy is not to use preview software. There's language around preview software that we don't like. We'd love to use your tool, but it needs to be fully released so that we know that it's fully supported. So that's the first reason. There's customers we know will use it, and we um, we need to you know give confidence that it's fully supported. Uh, the second is there's some scenarios where because you know as George said in the previous section uh, session we didn't just try to copy third parties or do things in a different way we tried to look at things, what are the things that only we can fix and performance was one of those key things right especially with OneDrive's uh, I remember working with a customer a few years back. And their initial estimate for OneDrive migration, this big migration was something like for all their users over a year to migrate everyone's OneDrives. And it just wasn't acceptable. And so the way that we do first party one, OneDrive migration is just way, way faster due to the, the different um, tech used. And so that on its own is a reason why customers will choose to um, to use our first party products. 
all that said, we recognize that it's not an ideal situation if you like if you're paying for another license that has all of the functionality you need, but you you then you need a, a second license for you know you just, but basically you're you're buying more than you're going to use if if you have to if you want to use our stuff as well as a third party to complete the scenario. So we'll keep driving forward to to release um, the the complete picture that Georgia explained in the previous session. But we're confident we'll get a lot of use of mailboxes and OneDrives um, by releasing it to GA as soon as possible. So ho hopefully that makes sense. Uh, I'm just catching up on the chats. Please raise your hand if you have any other uh, questions as well. Lots of questions about SharePoint and OneDrive for an exchange conference. Uh, I'm going to touch on throttling while I'm waiting for people to uh, to raise their hands because they're in talking to customers and looking at support cases. Sometimes there are some misconceptions around throttling, and uh, Gary Mazet is commenting on um, you know hopefully we can be better with our first party stuff. So the general way that throttling works in in the service, and I'm going to talk about the platform that Exchange is built on specifically. It tends to be based on compute resources. Um, one common misconception is that throttling, you know, of compute resources on a server is done on a per tenant basis. Sometimes we get support calls saying, "I'm using such and such migration tool. Are you blocking my tenant because we're trying to migrate too much stuff?" And the answer is no. We're not blocking you specifically. Um, we have a very deliberate resource allocation on our servers. And um, it's something that you'll probably agree with. We will prioritize the core functions of you know, connecting to your mailbox via Outlook or OWA, sending and receiving mail above functions that involve moving data around in the background. Um, now, the protocols that third parties use have different, different throttling than the protocols that we use. And we do run, for instance, the MRS uh, MoveTech that we use to move mailboxes at the highest possible priority for cross-tenant mail uh, box migration that we can. So out of, for, for instance, if, if uh, you were going to compare moves related to load balancing versus moves related to cross-tenant mailbox migration, now, now I'm trying to remember, there, the, I think migration is is at the highest priority that we can do. So, um, I I don't know, George, did you have any like insights? It's throttling it tends not to be an issue with our first party stuff the way that it is with the third parties, um, because it's just different technology that's more efficient. Yeah, I mean that's what that's what we've seen in our preview. So. Um, some of you may know that the cross tenant mailbox migration preview has been running for over two years. Um, we've probably migrated over definitely over a million mailboxes. Thousands of tenants have participated um, and throttling is not something that that comes up. Um, and so. So, yeah, there are um, there are gates within the MRS infrastructure in general that are there to protect the service. But as Rob mentioned, um, MRS does get um, a top priority for our migration. So um, so throttling is just not um, an escalation that um, that we've taken off often. It's typically we do see the um, escalations for EWS throttling. There's a good question that I'll just uh, generalize, and then Dominic, as you just raise your hand, uh, Christopher is building on this. Uh, are there plans for migrations of forms, flows, whiteboard, etc.? Um, so our approach has been to focus on the apps that are most used: Exchange, OneDrive, SharePoint, and Teams. Uh, as as a team, we're going to focus on Teams uh, the most over the you know the coming year. 
and really try really work at getting Teams chat migration um, into preview. That's by far the what we've heard from customers is the most important next scenario. And then beyond that, we we don't have specific plans for other workloads, um, but we will prioritize that based on customer feedback. So if you've got scenarios um, that that you want to see us address after Teams uh, and SharePoint, then you know keep providing feedback. We we take it seriously. Um, Dominic, go ahead. Yeah, thanks, Robert. Hi, everyone. So are there any limitations in regards of uh, delegated mailbox access, like senders, full access, or delegated um, permissions? Would they be moved, or is there something broken after one mailbox is going to be moved to the target? Yeah, so I can answer that. So um, permissions that um, are set at the store level are migrated with the mailbox. Um, permissions that are set in the directory only um, are not migrated because they're two different directories and different user objects on each side. Awesome, thank you. And will there any be warning showing up? For example, hey, this user has a forwarding enabled. If you migrate, it will be a lost or any kind of information for the uh, um, send as permissions, for example? Uh, no, we currently don't have any warnings. OK, no, thank you. Permissions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks. Uh, Stefan, go ahead. You've got your hand up. Yeah, sure. Uh, I'm not sure if this is already asked, but how will it go with uh, moving archives with the mailbox? The expansion and so on. I, I know that's a problem uh, usually. <laughs> archives? I'm sorry, yeah. I kind of missed that part. Okay, sure. Um, so, so today in our existing preview, you can move your primary mailbox and your archive mailbox, no problem. Um, soon, we will be releasing support for the ability to move the primary mailbox, the archive mailbox, and the auxiliary archives as well. Mm. Super. Thanks. Uh -huh. Catching up on the chat questions. If there's anything we've missed, uh, raise your hand and, and we'll talk about it. Maybe just a general question for everybody out there, but of the things you're most concerned with that you've heard we don't yet support, are there ones that you would say like this this is my priority, like this is the thing you guys would need to solve for us to be interested? I'll jump in. Um one of the things that's always the pain point is Outlook updates. So if it's a large organization, people aren't going to recreate their Outlook profiles. So we'd have to go third party for that. <laughs> and re-download their whole OST. Exactly, yeah. Unless you're able to do some kind of magic like you do with hybrid migrations from on-prem exchange. You know, that's that's a corner that Microsoft has held for years is you know, you're able to realign the existing OST files to the um, 
to the new to the new accounts. And if you can recreate that magic for this, right? We save all the effort of recreating profiles and re-downloading the the mail. So that that is certainly a big headache. Definitely, and and I have to say, I think I had mentioned this in our last session. Um, uh, the ability for uh, reutilization of the Outlook profile is definitely in the top five of requests from customers. So, um, you know, it's 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 on my list of something to investigate. The challenge is, it's just to be very honest, it's a hard problem to solve um, because the uh, the target tenant is a new identity with a different UPN. Um, so we'd have to figure out a way uh, to make the match. So it's definitely there. I understand the challenge. It would make uh, the experience much better for the end user and the IT admin alike. So. I had posted into the chat also that the ability to go from commercial to into GCC would be nice. We have a lot of townships and boroughs and such that are making the transition, particularly for their police departments or just their cities, even in general, to say, you know, we need to get into the GCC. So if that is technically possible, I know you're there's a boundary there, but that would certainly be nice. And hey, while we're dreaming, if you could move the entire tenant from a commercial into the GCC, <laughs> that would be great. I was going to ask you that question. Uh, is what you're really looking for just a few migrations to divest some of them or the whole tenant? But um, yeah, we we don't have anything concrete to share on that, Matthew, but it's we we have other customers in the same situation. Yeah, for us, for us, it is always a, a wholesale tenant organization move. And and I know there were some concerns earlier about you know, the secondary services, OneDrives and SharePoints and Teams and all that kind of stuff. We do have plenty of organizations that are just, you know, exchange online plan one and plan two mailboxes. And they want to move um, into a new tenant, you know, particularly from a commercial to a GCC. And this would be an ideal tool if we could, you know, make that one, one final leap there. Thank you. This is great news. Looking forward to it. Quick question for the folks with the profile updating. I admittedly don't know how this is handled today, so don't screw me too bad. But for those of you that are doing migrations, say from like one customer to another, how are you handling the Windows profile? So you know, updating the Outlook profile is one thing, but what happens when the underlying like desktop has to change a domain or something? It's ugly. <laughs> <laughs> so we have uh, different engineers that we just run some scripts you know, and then if it's Azure AD join, that's a whole different story. We found that there's a tool called Forens IT that handles that really well, but it's a multi-pronged approach. And um, Quest has the desktop update agent, which is growing and changing and helping out a lot. Bit Titan really just does Outlook, um, but yeah, then it leaves the desktop itself too for us to handle. We, we have said that we will throw buckets of money at whatever company creates the secret <laughs> tool to move not just, you know, Active Directory to Active Directory, like Heidi was talking about, but also, quite frankly, moving from tenant to tenant. Because once you get a workstation that's embedded into Azure Active Directory with the device registration, and then trying to get that computer out of the source tenant into the destination tenant and dealing with the device registration, the office suite profile, the OneDrive profile, Teams, Outlook, and everything else that goes with it. And oh, wait, you think you've got it, but when you log back in, suddenly you're getting the error that says, I can't find this user because it's still looking at the old tenant. You know, that is the biggest hurdle when it comes to tenant to tenant migrations. And we tell our customers this will be the pain point of the whole migration. And we either have to throw lots of bodies at it or you have to have lots of bodies at it or just realize it's going to take a few days. Because even using the friends IT tool, you know, that helps with Active Directory to Active Directory, but it can't do the rest. Mm hmm. Multi pronged. So if you guys could just get on that, that'd be bad. <laughs> by Halloween. <laughs> Thanks for the feedback. That was really detailed. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I see Ken Harrell has a 
Oh, we just popped out. You had a question about um, personal tags, personal retention tags. Uh, Ken, can you explain this a little bit more? Um, I'm interested to learn more. As well. Yeah, learn learn more about what the users are trying to do, and uh, see how we could help. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yep. So we have um, a couple of retention tags, um, and when we try to migrate someone over, trying to figure out how what tags were actually used and which weren't, either having the user do it or me do it for them. Um, it is a struggle. In other words, in Outlook, is there a way to filter any all filter based on a retention tag? Mm -hmm. So if there's a never delete tag, I want a user to say, hey, move that. We don't have that tag or whatever tag it is. You need to move that out of your inbox so that it doesn't hit a different retention tag when it gets into Exchange Online. Are you talking about a migration from on-prem to the cloud? Yes. Hmm. So if you, I can answer that one. Oh, th thanks, Rob. <laughs> You're welcome. Um, if, if you're migrating from on-prem to the cloud, um, you can use uh, the HCW to uh, sync those tags, and they would exist in both, both sides. I don't want those tags. OK, so then uh, outside of that, if you don't want the tags at all, um, I mean, clearly you're going to want to have some because otherwise you're going to break. Yeah, we, we, we have a set of tags that we already use. Uh, we don't want to add additional tags and we want them to either re-tag them or we want them to move them to a, an area outside of the inbox that won't be subject to any tags. It's, the never delete is the most important one. Um, we don't have a never, we don't, or there's a couple of tags that we've ran across from other organizations, from acquisitions and mergers. And then when we try to move them in, we either have to add the tag, which we don't really want to do, or I, I just want to tell the users, hey, you know, find all the messages that have that retention tag and either re-tag them or move them into a different folder. And I, I don't know of any way to filter by a retention tag. Yeah. You, there, there are a couple things in the service that you can do around the discovery and around searching for those tags. Um, but in the scenario you're proposing there, um, the the only way it would be something like you would have to create something going through AWS to to crawl the user's mailbox to see okay. if the tags were exposed. Um, if you're not, I mean, if you're moving them from on-prem to online and you're not syncing any of those retention tags, then none of them apply. So you might be able to get away with here's the new tags that we're going to allow you to utilize. Um, and that's what's burned us, right? Stuff. So they'll have a never delete tag. It gets and moved into- And then stuff gets deleted. Yep, and then it gets deleted, and then we get yelled yeah, at. <laughs> I've, I've been on those calls too. <laughs> so yeah, unfortunately, there's it, it's very difficult because that's an attribute associated with each individual message, especially yep. when it comes to personal tags. It's a little easier on the folder level, but when it comes to messages, it's an attribute on the message, unfortunately. Okay, so it's a crawl through, and there's no way that the user can filter that in their own OWA or Outlook. No, not easily. You can tell what's associated by either uh, uh, you know, we have some scripts out there, or you could, you know, look at what's assigned to the user, but that'd be, be about the limit. Um, do me a favor, and if if there if if there's an EWS, I, I've seen some of those EWS, you know, ways to do it. If you have one that you know works, could you shoot that in the chat? And also, what you were talking about with, you know, you mentioned another method as well. Yeah, we have. There's a script out there that's on our support uh, yep. GitHub that that'll grab that. So yeah, I'll I'll, I'll put that in the chat and um, yeah, I'll see if that blog. There was a couple blogs um, from a while so, ago that should still work, but uh, it's all use at your own risk since it is EWS scripting. So, so that's that the script is that's one that I can before I move a user, I can run the script and say, hey, these messages have a tag that need and you need to move them. You would, yeah, you would have to create something like that. Yeah, I could give you some samples of what EWS does, but that'd be the limit of what I have. Okay. I hate tags, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Policies are so much easier. 
yeah the yeah yeah the the yeah the personal tags are terrible um okay thank you great thanks so dominic has an interesting scenario and i see stefan you just put your hand up um here's one for the panel do you have any experience for policies that are applied to the source mailbox for example mobile application management policies uh and then after migration, will those settings align immediately, or does this require reinstallation of Outlook, reboot of the device? There's a lot of things to unpick in this, um, but I wanted to see if anyone on the panel wanted to take a crack at uh, at this. Is there a specific scenario, Dominic, that you um, behavior that you're observing and you're questioning or you're just curious about how it, how it should work? Yeah, I'm just curious uh, if we have a best practices recommendation for our customers or yeah, if you have tested something, just curious. Yeah, this, this is in some ways related to the earlier conversation about device management. I think device management all up, how you remove the device from the old tenant and or reconfigure it for the destination. So I don't think we know the answer to your question, but um, what we do know is that, when, forget about Intune for a minute and just talk about like settings and Outlook. Um, after, you, after the user migrates, they got to put in their new username and password. So they get a new profile and all of that, um, which should just pick up all of the new settings. But um, I, I think there's something for us to dig into here about the end-to-end -end, uh, scenario. Yeah, so I don't know if this is still the case, but it at least was, so uh, I don't know. I mean, I have then two accounts. So if the mailbox is, for example, migrated and I have um, specific mobile application policies applied to my device, I can't add another account from the other tenant in Teams, for example, because it's limited to one account in Intune. Okay. I yeah. Yeah. I, th this could be a a problem for some customers because they want to have all of them on their mobile devices. Yeah, I'm just thinking out loud. Sorry for the question. So. <laughs> yeah. No, that part makes sense. Yeah. We need yeah. to, uh, like I said, device management is one of our gaps. We don't have a migration story for devices. It can be painful. Users have to unregister them and re-register, and then there's the scenario where you just called out that we didn't talk about where. The device, you can't register a device in two places. Yeah, fair enough. Thank you. Uh, Stefan, did you want to ask your question? Uh, yes, uh, I, I would actually go back to the earlier question about retention policies, uh, just so I understand. Uh, when we are migrating a mailbox from uh, one tenant to another, uh, it will there be any way to actually have the mail objects keep the retention policies and uh, that those policies will be active in the target tenant? Or is this a manual work? Like, yeah, we, we have those retention policies in source. We migrate those manually or with a script and then ask the users to reapply them to every mail item in their mailbox. Or how, how does it work when it comes to retention policies in mail migrations? Sure, I can take this one um, and Rob Whaley, <clears throat> feel free to jump in here too. Um, so uh, we don't have a solution to uh, copy the retention policies from the source to the target, unlike we do with the um, on-prem to the cloud migration and hybrid. Um, and so when the mailbox gets migrated over, there's essentially um, no policy applied or the default retention policy in the target tenant would be applied. Um, so the, since the mail user object exists prior to the migration, you could always see if it's a, a member of a specific retention policy. Um, but since they're two different tenants, um, the we don't have a solution to, to sync those retention policies between the two tenants. Um, would the, can I, Ask a question would the um, ideal solution here be that you could take a retention policy and associated set of tags and have them replicated in the target tenant such that when you move the mailbox from source to target 
the existing retention policy that was applied in the source and then applied in the target after migration and those policies take place would that be like the ideal situation or scenario yeah yeah exactly i mean if if, if we try to have our users work with retention policies mm -hmm. and they do it for a long period and uh, they have uh, retention policies on most of their emails and then we do a ma mail migration then then we would like to have it the same in the in the target mm -hmm. uh, as it is now it's more or less like okay uh, we, we have to ask them to redo it and how, how should they know about old emails that they tagged uh, one year ago <laughs> it, it, it it makes sense um uh this is not, um, I, I mean, I'm very excited that you brought this up. It, it's actually not a scenario that I've, uh, or a request that I've heard of a lot, typically because um, are either the the users who have divested to a new company or merged into an, an existing company, those, the target tenants, the target company has their own set of retention policies um, that they want to apply to those new users. Um, but I can see the scenario where uh, you would want to be able to provide those end users with the same retention policy that they had in the source. So um, yeah, yeah, I think my question is actually focused on those uh, personal tag uh, retention policies. I mean, you can have retention policies uh, for all mailboxes in general, mm -hmm. but uh, if if the users, oh, for instance, if you have a retention policy that all emails older than one year should be deleted or removed. Sure. Uh -huh. uh, and then we have a couple of retention policies to keep data, like uh, if this is an important or legal requirement, you should keep it for 10 years, apply mm -hmm. a retention label. How do we keep that intact when we move the mailbox to a new tenant? I mean, we can have the, the policies in place, uh, like creating them and so on, but how do we make mm -hmm. those emails that were tagged with 10 year? So they, they will not be de deleted in, in one year after we have moved them. <laughs> so, so there is some attribution that does stay behind. Um, the personal tag issue is certainly a conundrum, right? Because, um, you know, we're even recommending folks to, to start doing, you know, start looking at it more query based, more larger scale so that you don't have mm. to, so that the end user, to your point, doesn't have to go, what do I do with this, you know, this message? How do I, mm. how do I classify this message? Um, so it's a whole different subject altogether but mm -hmm. um you know that that is one one thing to to obviously look at when you're going into those kind of scenarios is you know how can we move a lot of this up to that um the other piece is if you if you look at a piece of mail with like mfc mappy or or you know look at the properties of, of a message um you, you know there are some attribution that gets stamped on there that does get copied over and does get moved over and so some of that yeah. behavior would still would uh, uh you know still exist so so my suggestion for for you would be like if you do have an ability to have some some demo tenants throw some personal tags on there and um mm. use mfc mappy and and you can kind of see those attributes or some content out there i'll see if i can find some uh i think we had a blog out there on elo um in regards to that but uh um you can see that attribution and then when you take it over and do a tenant to tenant migration on that mailbox you'll see some of that attribution remains so if you Put another one in there, especially when you're just talking about the exchange personal tags, um, mm. those attributions will stay. When it comes to looking again, if you start looking holistically more over into purview and into data lifecycle management, which aka is retention, same thing. Mm -hmm. um, when, you, when we start utilizing those policies, they look at things slightly different. They look at things as a compliance officer would expect, looking at the date of the message, the creation date, the send dates. And so mm. um, you don't have to worry about that when you're when you're talking about targeting policies um, from the, the the compliance center itself or the purview, excuse me, um, mm. itself. Yeah, yeah, that that would probably be better. But uh, as as it is now, we uh, have several customers that are working with personal tags and uh, crawling through every mailbox after ma mailbox migration. I, I don't see that we would be able to manage that within the it's time. It's not when tenable. We, we, yeah. What? It, it's not. Yeah, you can't do that. It, it's very difficult to use, and, and especially when your users are just exactly acclimated with. I get this contract. I stamp. I do this process. They don't. They aren't mm. thinking why they do it. They just know they do it. So yeah, unfortunately, 
Um, I think the primer that I kind of put up there uh, on in the chat just a minute ago um, is probably going to get you a good starting uh, spot there to kind of at least help mm -hmm. you look at those properties. But again, we don't have anything nope. today that would uh, that would do that because that would entail crawling every message and seeing yeah. <laughs> what attributions <laughs> okay. on there while we, mm -hmm. while we do the migration. That would definitely not be a quick process. No. Yeah, so that that would be that would be on the wish list then <laughs> to have that. Yeah, and I was just gonna say to Stefan, I would um, you know, if you have the opportunity to do a test migration and a test topology with the specific scenario that you're encountering with the customer, and mm. um, you create a wish list or identify gaps that you would like to see it. I provided um, my feedback alias in the chat too. I would um, love to know about that um, because. You know, although we're saying we're generally available um, by the end of the year, you know, there's always room for improvement. It doesn't mean we're going to stop adding yeah, features or making it better. So yeah, um, I, I, I would love that feedback. Yeah, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. All right. Thanks, everyone. I realize we went a little bit over time and really appreciate the discussion um, and, and your participation in MEC overall. So thanks again. Hope you have a great rest of the conference and uh, good afternoon or evening, depending on where you are. And uh, we look forward to hearing from you soon. Thank you. Bye. -bye. Yeah, bye. Everybody, have a great night.